Okay. So today we will go through two things. So last uh, time we went through uh, Python and uh, num NumPy for array computing. Uh, today we'll go through the runtime library of Python. So what functionality is built into the function that you can use in Python. So, uh, and, and the sec second part is uh, go through a little bit about ob object oriented programming. So already right now, when we have, we have been looking at Python, we are using objects. So almost all variables and all uh, features in, in Python are implemented as objects. So for example, you have a, a variable here that is an object with, with methods and things you can query on this variable. And I will go through the high level course of what, what it actually means, object-oriented programming. So that's the second part. So first part, we're going through see what, um, if you need some services in your code from the system, for example. So um, you can, of course, in Linux, you can go on a command line terminal to type different things to get information out of your, your system. Um, but you really don't want to do that because that is very um, platform specific. So on a Mac, uh, the commands are different from a Windows machine. Uh, and Python can hide that uh, from you because it has a lot of built-in function that uh, does the same thing. So one thing that is very common in, in many applications is uh, the use of environment variables. So environment variables are variables that are part of the operating system uh, environment uh, to determine different things of the current user, the current working directory, and so on. And in Python, you can access those functions using a special module called OS. So that stands for operating system. So that module contains a lot of the operating system functions in a way that is uh, uh, platform independent. So uh, this looks the same uh, regardless of any platform you're running it. So for example, here, I can print out path, which is a environment variable that sets the uh, path or the search order for the, the commands that are available in an operating system. So that variable exists in our system, and we can query that. Um, so if we run this, uh, on top here, you can see this is the path. So you can see here that we have a search path op bin. Usually there are, there are it's, uh, three letters bin for binary. There's user local and media bin, user local CUDA bin. And when you execute commands on a, on a, on a machine, uh, the system will search all these paths for information and it's stored in this variable called path. So accessing it is done through a dictionary called os.enviro. So all the variables available in the system can be accessed using the dictionary way of accessing. So you give it a string with a variable name here and that function, that dictionary will return you the value of the path, the, the environment variable. You can also loop over all the, the variables in the system like this. So like that could do with looping over a list, for example, for variable in OS environment, uh, it prints out the variable name and the value of the, var the, the variable. And you can see here, now we are running on a, on a cloud server on Google, but it has a lot of environment variables. So here you can see there's a Linux machine, the shell is a bin bash. Uh, and you can see all the other variables that are set. I think also there is a, um, a language is US, the host name. Um, there is also uh, working directory is slash home, that is your home directory. So these, these are a way of getting access to all the variables that are set in the system. And you can actually, uh, within your running Python session, you can change the variables here and you can add them just like a dictionary. So OS environment test, that is our new <coughs> environment variable. And then you just assign it a value like this. And if you print it out, it's available in the environment. So this can be important if you want to execute other computational codes that rely on environment variables. You can, inside Python, you can change the environment variables. And when you execute the code, it will, these variables will be, will be seen by that application. And um, this is completely platform independent. So it works on all platforms, uh, regardless of the, the internal syntax. So that was environment variables. 
Uh, there's also a way if you only want to work with a path. So you can, of course, uh, get the path from the path environment variable, but it's kind of then you have to parse it yourself and it's in a system uh, dependent way. So what you can do instead, you can do os.getExec path and it, it will return you a list of the current path. So here you can see, instead of having this environment variable with a string with all the paths, you can get a list of all the search paths. So it's the operation will start searching in this directory and continue down like this. Another important thing is that when, when you run a Python program, you, you are in a certain directory and you type Python and then you give it the script. Uh, the directory you're standing in is the current working directory for CWD in Unix terms. And you can query Python for what current working directory are we in. So os.getcvd, that will return you the current working directory. You can change the working directory by using change here. And double dots here will go up the directory structure. And then you can print it again, print it again here and see what happens here. So here we should be in root. No, we are apparently in content. <laughs> Uh, so slash content is the current working directory. If we go change dir here for sh dir dot dot, we are in the root. And then we go back here to the old working directory here with restored in the string. You can see here we are back here again. So this is a way of changing where we are running your code. It can be useful if you have a program that you, if you want to store files in a certain directory, you can uh, create that directory and go inside the directory and then run your code and everything, all files written by defaults are written to the working directory if you don't give it a path. Um, and that is also something you could have done that with calling a command in in, uh, in Linux or Windows, but that then you have to have two versions, one for Windows and one for, for Linux. And, and that is kind of cumbersome. So here you have platform independent commands for querying the system state. Another important task that we want, would like to do is work with the files in the directory. So here, I that's also a tip. If you're running a notebook, uh, the exclamation mark here uh, gives you an ability to execute commands in the system. So the hit, touch here is not a Python command, that is a Linux command. And what I do here, just create an empty file in my directory here, just kind of have something to list. So there's a function here built into the OS module called list here, and it just does just like that. It returns you a list of all the files in the current working directory. And then you can um, iterate over this list, and you can check here os.path is here. So you can ask Python, is this a directory? Because list here will list both directories and files. And then um, if path is file, then it prints it's a file instead. So you can see here that uh, I have two files here, or more you have config, test file, sample data. And you can see here dot config, that is a directory, so it says catalog. This is a file, so it says file. And here, that is catalog sample data. So this way you can actually look for files in the directory. So if you have a code that wants to query, okay, uh, I want to process all the files in the current directory, I can do list here. I can process them, check for extensions and see if they are the files I want to examine and loop over. You can also change uh, work with the directories in multiple ways. So all I mentioned the get CVD command, uh, but you can also there's make dir, which is similar to MD on Windows and make dir on Linux, and we will create a directory. And so in this case, it will create a directory called OS5, and then I can change it to that directory. And inside that one, I can create another directory. I can open test file to write to, list dir. I can rename a file. Um, I can also remove a directory. Uh, I can only remove empty directories with a standard command. So RMD will only work if the if the directory is empty. Remove to remove a file. So let's see here who run this. 
you can see here that uh, when I have removed everything here, there is no files in that directory, so it's empty. So all of these commands give you access to the system commands, but in a, in a platform independent way. So running this on a Windows machine will produce the same results as running it on a, on a Linux machine. I think that is one of the really good things with Python. It's enabled you to kind of combine platforms. You don't have to think about the system details if you use the built-in modules, because it's also possible to do um, I don't want to show it too much, but system, and then you type a command ls here like this. That will tell Python to call a system command, in this case, list. It will list the files in the dot directory. So if I run this here now, okay, there's no, well, didn't produce it because it's empty. So I can do uh, something else instead. PS. Yeah, I'm not sure, it, it executes the command. I'm not sure where the output goes on a notebook here, but OS system is uh, calling a system command, and executing it and running it outside. Uh, you can also go a bit deeper into the file system and, and uh, query, query the details of files using the OS Scandia command. Uh, and here you get an entry for each, part, uh, each file it scans. Uh, and then you can do, Entry name and the pass. Uh, if it's a deer, there's a special um, method here to query if it's a file or it's a directory. Here you can see you have a file name, the path. It's a directory or not? Is it a file? No. Here is a file. Uh, no. Yeah, this is a file here, test file, and the location of it. Uh, you can also uh, uh, walk through directories using uh, the walk command. <laughs> and that, that will actually recursively go through a directory structure. So if you have a deep directory structure, you can use this here to loop over the entire tree. So you have, you have root directories files in OS walk. So you say, uh, this is dot, this is the current working directory. We'll start there. And you can print out uh, information about where you are in the walk. So again, it found config here, uh, and uh, the roots is this one. This is the directories, and this is the files, and it continues here and goes through all the files. Now it goes through the log files and it finds another file there, and then it continues recursively through the entire directory structure. <coughs> you can also query uh, more op operating system close uh, information here. So there is something called stat um, status here, which will query the operating system about more attributes of the files. Uh, so let's see what we get out from this. So here you get a lot of system, and, and this is the, can be very specific depending on the operating system here. But you can see here the mode of the file, which if it's as reader only flag sets, you can see it set here when it's created here, the size, uh, the UID. That is, so when you're running a notebook in, in the cloud, you're always running as root. So UID is zero, UID is zero. If you're running on, on Cosmos or on our Lunar resources, there will not be zero. You have your own UID and GID. One, problem, one thing that always comes up when you're doing uh, codes that do that work with files is a way to manipulate paths and combine paths to, to new paths. And that becomes very uh, troublesome when you're working, for example, with, with uh, both Windows and Linux because they handle paths very differently. Uh, but you have some commands here in Python here. Paths, apps, paths that will return absolute paths of the current working directory. Uh, the base name will uh, return the name of the file here, and the dear name will, will return this part here. So by using these commands, you can query uh, different things in your code, uh, so you get the correct things of the path. Now you can also check for uh, if a file exists. So OS path exists, 
maybe give it a path here to check that this file actually exists. Um, you can also get modification time, creation time, and access time. So you can check when a file has been modified. There's expand user here. So on a, on a Linux machine, you have a notion of a, a user directory, which is a tilde here. So that will return you your, your uh, user directory in a real path, not a short character like that. You can get, get, get the size of a file. You can check if it's absolute path or not. Let's see here. Yeah, I forgot to start. Uh, you can also do, uh, so one problem we have on Linux and Windows machine is that paths on a Windows machine have backslashes. And on a, on a Linux machine, they have forward slashes. And if you, you want to join things here, uh, there is a built-in function for actually doing this automatically. So you take a deer, regardless of uh, the file name of path, and then the file name is with combining together with the right uh, separator. And then you also have a split here. You can split up the path in di different ways. Uh, I will see what it does. So a split drive, and you in a Windows machine, you will get the driver as well. And you can get the extension. Here. Here you can see that it's connected them together here. Uh, it ignored, yeah, didn't do a perfect job, I can see. Uh, but here you can see you have uh, the split. The first the normal split here is the first one here. You can see you have the um, directory and the file name. And here you can split on a drive. If there's a drive, it doesn't do it, it doesn't do it well on a Linux machine. And here you can get the, the path and the extension. So before you uh, implement your own functions here, it's a very good idea to check the runtime library of Python because it's Python, they say, say that Python has the batteries built in compared to other languages. And that's true because it has a really large runtime library that is part of the Python distribution. And you can do a lot of things with it. Um, I will go. Uh, there is another one, a library that uh, generalizes path management even more. So here you can define a, a special object called path. And then you can use that to combine using the slash operator here to, without specifying almost anything concrete, you can get paths out of it. So you can see here that it added here. So it, it, it started with the current uh, working directory, and then it added test here, and then it automatically combined that using the, pass, the current separator of, the, of your system. Uh, and then you could uh, let's see if it exists. Uh, and then you can print the parts, print the drive, you can print the current working directory, and you can work with uh, uh, there are built in op uh, attribute methods of this to query different things here. And you can also iterate over. Uh, the path here, so you can do the for loop here to do the same thing we did before we scanned scan deer like this. Yeah, and then you can do change the path here. So you can do, if you want to change the current directory, you can just put p into the change deer command here and it will change the directory. Um, skip that nice. One thing that is can be really important is when you do uh, calculation and uh, running uh, uh, computational codes is that you need temporary files. That and temporary files are files that you after the code has executed you don't need it anymore, and you can uh, can just yeah you can erase them. Um, in Python you can ask it to create temporary files for you automatically. So there is this function here called temp file make s temp. So that stands for make secure temporary. And that returns you the file object and the path for that temporary file. Uh, and then you can check here that this actually is a file. 
Then you can open this file and write to this file. And then you can remove the, the temporary file. So it will look at the system, ask the system, where do we create temporary files? And it will use that and, and uh, automatically create a temporary file in that location where the system usually creates temporary files. So let's run here. And you can see here that it creates a temporary file here, slash TMP, TMP, COA, EDX00. So it actually creates a random kind of file name for the temporary file. So uh, it's also important that you don't uh, tell people what you're doing. It's, it kind of hides that the fact that this is what is, uh, who has created this file. And this is what it contains. And then you remove the file afterwards. But you can, you can do it even more uh, automatic. So here you have to still have to remove the file when you're done with it. Um, there is a special uh, object called temporary file, which you can use instead of this manual instruction here. So then you create the name, it creates. You can see that it's a file, you can write to the file. But after this with statement here, uh, if we run this code, you can see here that the file is no longer, it's gone. So this will create a file, it will let you write to the file, uh, but after the with statement here, so when you close the file, the file is gone. So it's it's a way of uh, automatically creating a file and also, also letting the Python runtime automatically also clean it up for you. So you don't have to do anything with it. So next is something that is also something that you can uh, you need to do in your, if you want to automate your workflow with Python, you need to be able to start other programs and perhaps also control the other programs in a way that uh, have they finished or have they not finished. <clears throat> there is a module called subprocess, uh, which you can use to create additional processes outside of your own running code. And here I use uh, specify the binary ls and options for my command ls. Result here will give you a result of the execution of that process. So your subprocess.run will run ls. If everything is well, the, the result will contain an attribute called return code. And if it's zero, the process will uh, has run. So if I run this, the process returns zero, so ls works. But if I just try to say if I find some command that doesn't exist here, uh, uls or something, you can see here, okay, there is no ULS command. So you can see here it, it crashed. <clears throat> but it can also be that the command is there, but it doesn't execute correctly. And then it crashes. And then it usually, if a, if you have a well-behaved code, it will return a non-zero return code. So you can see here, then you can also query which return code was called. Uh, this form of commands, then you have to you have to add the command here and the parameters arguments to the command like this. So it actually doesn't run in a in a bash shell. It runs as a separate process completely. But in many cases, you want to run a command in the bash environment. And then you have to add some options here. So shell true that means that it creates a command line terminal for, for running the code. Uh, which has access to all the commands. And then here you can also uh, redirect the output from the code. So in, in, the, in the last example here, you, you didn't see any output. The ls command just disappeared. It didn't show anything on the screen. Uh, with standard subprocess pipe, it redirects the output to, uh, from this code here. And uh, you can also see that uh, this, this final one here is uh, a hack to handle the new lines in output. Uh, I'm not sure why we need that, but somebody has said that we need that. So if you run it here, then you can query here the output from the command. So stood out here, chance of standard output will contain all the output that this command has produced. So this can be useful if you want to call a calculation command, command to do some calculation, and you want to process the output from that command. You can specify your command here, 
not LS, but something else, my super duper program and run it here. And then you can catch all the outputs in that code and process it. So let's see if it runs here. So now you can see here, that this is the result from the uh, list command. So it, it started the process, caught all the output, and now we can process it with this output. Uh, the problem with the, this command here is that when you execute run, the Python execution will stop here until the, the actual command has completed. So basically your code will freeze, wait until it's executed, and then only after it has executed, you do the if statement here. Sometimes you want to start something, continue your execution in your Python code, and wait for uh, and check if that other process has completed. And you can do that with the sub process p open command. So what happens now here when you do this, it creates you a, a new variable called p, which is the process. But execution will start directly after here. So it will continue directly here. It will not wait for this command to complete. It will continue. If you want to wait for that process to complete, you can you can ask, you can do p.wait. Now it stops here, waits till this process has finished, and then it continues. So you can see here you get more control over how you execute. So you could do something, other thing in Python here, and then at some point here, okay, I need to wait for the process to finish here, I do p-wait. Now we didn't see anything, so it's not so, but but it uh, stops here. So uh, to actually illustrate how this can work, so instead of uh, calling ls, we call sleep, which is a, the most ineffective command in, in Linux. It just sleeps for a certain number of seconds. So you say sleep for five seconds. And now instead of waiting, we can do people. And if people returns none, uh, the, the command has not finished yet. So we can, we can sit here and wait for the command to complete. And then and we can do other things here uh, when it's executing. So you do run here. You can see here it says wait, 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 wait. So that was approximately five seconds. So this went off, ran its task, and here we can call for uh, if it has finished. So if it's none, nothing has happened. Uh, if it returns something, uh, it um, you can exit the while statement here. Uh, you can also do more, uh, also get out the output from your code. So in this case, we modify here, we add standard out. Uh, we want to have that um, available. So we do sub process pipe. We create, uh, pipes are kind of uh, piping you can do between your processes. You can, you can uh, connect them with pipes. So what we do here, we want to have a pipe from standard output and from standard error. So many applications, they run, if everything is fine, they write everything to standard output. If something is wrong, they write it to standard error. So it's convention that man has, that has been set up. To get, to get the data here now when the process has been running, when it's done, so we have to wait here until it's done, we can communicate to the application using p communicates, and it will assign the output of standard output to this string here, the string variable, and error to this variable here. So then we print different ones here. So now what we do here, we have, we do this, uh, the directory, and then we save for four so that we see that it's uh, running in the background. So you can see here, standard output is this one here. And well, we don't have any standard errors here because uh, probably list here will not uh, return any errors here. But let's see if we can do uh, something to produce them. Now we didn't print out the. 
it's hard to create that example. But anyway, if it if it's uh, if there's an error, you you print that out using a standard error as well. You can also uh, make it a bit cleaner here. Um, so if something goes wrong here, we can just sweep here as well. And then it will automatically close uh, the process when it's done. So it's the same code as before. I usually, uh, instead of having to call popen, it's a bit complicated. I usually create a function called, for example, execute with output. So I want to execute this command here, and I want to get the output out. I, in, inside this function, I do p open command shell true. I want to catch standard output. And then if return code is zero, I return standard output. Otherwise, I just return none here. So then I, then I can, in my own code, I can do output execute command the output ls. If output is not none, I just print it out here and process the data here. So. You can see here that I, I uh, did an ls here. Uh, I got my output here. I split it with backslash n. So all the output you get from this process will have backslash of the, the character terms inside. So you need, if you split on backslash n here, you will get every line in the output. So then I can loop over and print them out. So you can see here, now I have a directory list in here in a, in a Python list. Let's get the login here. Yeah. So um, sometimes you need to. We already covered how to write file, how to write stuff to disk. Uh, but if you want to write a lot of data to disk. You have to decide on how to write the data to your files, and if you don't, if you want to um, be a bit, uh, don't have to figure out too much. You can use the built-in uh, modules in Python to do this. So there is a module called JSON that stays for JavaScript Object Notation, which is a standard for uh, writing text files with structured data. So suppose I have my data here. I have a dictionary here with a number. I have a list here in my dictionary, I have a other dictionary inside my dictionary, and I want to write that to disk and also be able to write that back again. I can do with open my data JSON. This is the usually the files are called JSON files. And then uh, write it here, and then I can do JSON dump. This is the variable I want to dump to, to the file, and then I specify my file here. That writes the data to the file as JSON, and I will look at it just later here. Then you can do the same thing here. My data copy here, json.load my file. So that will load the file, create the, the variables again with the Python corresponding Python data types. So just to look, let me see if we can run this here. You can see here, I print out my data copy here. And I print out the contents of my, my data JSON. So you can see here, I dumped this data structure to disk and loaded it again. And you can see here, this is the loaded variable. And if I print my the file here, you can see JSON notation is very similar to how Python data is written in Python code. So here you can see, this is actually the disk format. So JSON files, if you have smaller data structures, it's really a nice way of storing your configuration for a pro program, reading it back in a, in a in a easy way without, have, if you change anything, you have to rethink your file format. Here you have a file format you can use directly. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you can also, uh, instead of writing to a file, you can actually put the JSON output to a string. So if you do dumps here, my data here, this is a string containing a string version of this data structure. Then you can go the other way around, you can take a string and go to data structure here as well. So you can see a print JSON string. This is the JSON format of a dictionary. Then I load that string into, and then I get the data structure again. 
This is a Python data structure. This is just a string. Uh, they, you can also uh, print it out in a bit nicer way. If you have law structure, you have a single line of JSON is really hard to read. So what you can do is we can we can make it print in a, in a nicer way. So if you do dumps here, a set returns a string, you can add sort keys so they can true. Then it will print the keys in a alphabetical order. And you can specify indent equals to four. Then it will also do indentation of the code. So then you get a format like this. This is a start. Then you have the A dictionary, A next dictionary, and the third dictionary here. Um, this is human readable. So you can, so you can, you, for your program, you can create a configuration file that looks like this that people can edit. And then it's very, really easy to read it into a dictionary which you can use programmatically within, within SciPies. The JSON model, really good. There's also another way of storing things in a bit more compact way. Uh, and there is a module called Pickle, uh, which stores a data, data structure in binary form on disk. So here you have the same data structure here. You have open my Pickle as my file. And I, here you have to specify write binary, so WB, because Pickle files are binary files. Same thing we use it like the JSON here. You open as my file, and then you can pick a load, pick a dump, pick a load, and here you can print it out as well. So this is a way of a bit more efficiently writing data structure to disk. And JSON is good if you want to read the files. Pickle if you want to store it. Perhaps you don't want to read it. It just has to be there. Um, if we just uh, see here. You can see here, if I open this pickle file here, you can see that it's just garbage. So it contains binary data. Yeah, it's also possible there are some, if, if you have older pickle files here, you can specify here which protocol to use. Um, I wouldn't recommend to use pickle files to rely as, as a full file format. It's, it's good to dumping the data that you want to reuse later on in the calculation, but not as a file format for reading your input data. Um, yeah, you can do the same thing with strings here. You can do pickle dumps, dump S here for string. And uh, my data here. So then I get a string representation of my data, and I can print it out and you'll see that the binary, and then you can load that string back again to create data. The same thing as for uh, uh, the JSON. You can see here that I said, okay, B here stands for binary data here, and then you see that it's binary form, so it's not readable. But then if I load, take that string, convert it back, you get the dictionary. And you can you can pickle really complex data structures in Python, so it's it's it can handle a uh, lot of different things. Um, yes. Then I want to cover a bit about uh, data, uh, how to create archives of data. So let's download some files here first. So just as we do pickle files, you can also create compression archives uh, with Python. So there's a module called char file, and we import that file as tf. So we instead of having to prefix everything with char file, we have tf. So we create a char file, uh, my archive.tar.bz, write my tar. Then you can do add files that you want to include in that tar file. You can go the other way around, you can do read. Here you can print out which file names are included in the tar file, uh, and what members are there. You can extract a certain file. You can extract all. You can also list all the files here uh, using verb boxes to get a really detailed listing. 
you can see here that the header goes to. I get some tar info here. I get the listings of files contained in the tar archive. So the alternative to this would be to call the system functions to do to call the tar command on a Linux machine. But now Python has this built in, so you don't have to call a system function to do this. It actually does it automatically itself. So let's see what, what do we have here. So now you can see I have a my archive.tar.dz. DC stands for that it's compressed. And then it, it uh, if you untar that, you get it creates uh, the file. You can create extract everything to my tar all. So you can see here I have a directory here called my tar all here in the database. You can do the same thing with zip files. Zip file is more common on Windows to compress files. We import zip file as zf. Then uh, you create a new zip file here. I want to write it. My zip write, similar to the tar. Then you can do the same thing the other way around. You can do print, then I can extract, extract all, print here, open. So the syntax is a bit different. I don't know why they did that, but. So in this case, I have a my archive of zip, and I unzip everything here. And then I use Imre to read a file and show it on the disk as well. So okay, so what is the phone? Something happened my, with my build. Ah. Uh, previously, I could uh, download this file here. <laughs> now let's see if we can just modify this one. So apparently, it didn't download correctly. This should work. Yeah. So it extracted the file and it you have the image here. Uh, you can also uh, combine these operations together. So in this case here, I have my data here, and I want to um, create a pickle that into a string. Uh, uh, then I can use uh, the CLib library here to actually do compression on my string data automatically. So I can take this here, I can put it into my compress here, but then I get a new string out, and then I print out this just the length of this string to see if something happens. And then I can do CLib decompress, and I get the data back again, and then I can load my data here. So Python data, I create a pickle string here. I print the length of the string. I put the pickle string into my compression algorithm. I get the new string back that should be compressed. We'll see. Then I can decompress that again to get uncompressed data. I can put that into loads here, and I can extract it again. So you can see here the uncompressed data is 2,811 bytes. Now after compression, it's 1,915 bytes. And then you can see if I can actually get my data back again after the compress. So in this way, you can actually work with the data completely in memory here to compress the data. What do I do here?
Okay, I, it, it's just for comparison. So in this case here, I uh, did a JSON dumps here to compare the size here, and you can see that JSON files are a bit bigger. But uh, so Pico is more efficient in that sense. Yes, and then finally here, uh, we there are some other file formats that can be useful. Uh, there are uh, a special standard for a configuration file called ini files. Uh, you can those are the format like this. You have sections here uh, of things, and then you have value uh, attribute and value pairs here. So thermal values or something. So you can define variables here in your configuration that are grouped into different sections. And then you can open the file here, uh, and then you can do. We use something called config parser that can read this file and return sec uh, dictionaries here or different parts of the uh, configuration file. So you can loop over sections here and you can you can get the keys here, just like a dictionary. Um, so if you need that kind of files, you don't have to implement your own configuration files. Uh, you can also do it on the fly or the other way around. So you can create config files here uh, with creating the sections, the data inside here, and then you can write it as a config file and it looks something like this. Something perhaps more useful is in, in, uh, in computation science is to be able to read CSV files. So that is comma separated files. So I just downloaded one here. Uh, so here I have CSV, a CSV file, and there is a special module called CSV, which you can use the special module reader here to read here. You can determine here, I want to use the comma as the limiter, and then you can print the rows of data here. Uh, and you can also write data here using the right row commands instead. So let's see what we have here. So you can see here, uh, if we look at the file, so this is the input file. Uh, in the comments, you see the commas here between the items. And you can see here that it reads it into lists for each row and splits it up into the different sections here. This is not too complicated to do manually, but um that is built in if you if you really want to do advanced uh data now you probably did use something called pandas which is a way of using array data structures um and reading them in text-based data in arrays um but it's if you create want to go do quick csv parsing it's built in okay so that was the first part so we take a 10 minute break and then we continue with object-oriented program. So final part here is to just give you the basics of object-oriented programming. And I will, on Thursday, I will do a session with a more uh, live code and example of object-oriented programming to kind of illustrate it more in a more Nice way. So this this is a more of a theoretical description of it. So the basic concept of object-oriented program is that you uh, combine data method, data and method into single entity. So you have already seen it when you use strings in Python, you can do uh, dot split, and the dot split is a method uh, on on the string object. So an object uh, like a string has a lot of methods co connected to it. So it combines both functions and uh, data into a single object. So a string knows how to split itself, for example, so you can send message to it. Now, usually objects are described as nouns, such as point, circle, equation, model, square, string, for example. Uh, and you can interact with them using by sending messages. And messages are the verbs that you want to do on the object. And messages in Python are functions that you call on the object. So you have methods uh, on the object, which de define what object can do. 
Then you have properties that describe the attributes and links to other objects that are attached to this object as well. Objects are described and defined by classes. So a class is a blueprint for an object. So it's like a drawing. You want to create a, a new car. You, you make a template and you uh, cast that car into that, that template, you make a car. And the cast uh, is, is the kind of the blueprint for the car. And the blueprint from object is, is the class. So it's important that you not mix them up because the object is the concrete form, the variable that you have created, that is the object. Uh, then you have a string class that describes what the string can do. And you can have a point class that describes what the point can do. So if we go to object or function or uh, procedure-based programming that we have been used up to now, if you want to create a point library, uh, a module that mo manipulates points, you can, you can define a point data structure that contains X and Y, for example. So here I have a functions that manipulate points. So I have a function called create points that returns a list of X and Y. So the list of X and Y, that is our object that we want to manipulate, it's a pure data structure. So the list doesn't know that it is a point. We just uh, uh, pretend that it's a point for ourselves. So we will get something out from this function here that is a point. If we want to move the point, we can, if we have a function here, we need to specify what we want to manipulate. In this case, we pass the point over to the function and we want to move it delta x, delta y, and then we add, those, add to this point. Then we have, we, we want to zero the point, position is at zero, zero. So we just manipulate the points here to zero, zero. We set the point to a certain value. And you can see here, we always pass the point data structure over because the data structure itself doesn't know it's a point. We just treat it as a point using these functions. We can print the point here as well. So let's use this here. So what we can do now is we can create the point here, uh, P equals to create point 0 0.500, 0, and we print it out. So you can see here, we, we create the P here, that is our uh, point, but it doesn't know that it's a point, it's just a list. We pass it over here to the print point and it prints out point to the position of the point. We can move point, then we pass the uh, P over to this uh, function again. We move it in certain steps here. We can reset it to a certain position and we can print the point here as well. But P doesn't know anything about positions x and y, it's just a list. And this is the, if you want to do this in object orientation programming in function oriented language procedure like C, you need to do it something that you define a structure that is your point, you pass the structure along to functions that uh, functions that manipulate that structure. Uh, with Python and C++ and other languages, we can combine this into a single entity. A point that knows how to move itself, knows how to set its default values, it knows how to print itself. And we start by defining a blueprint for our point. Yep. When you point with the floating values, yes. can you, in the further process of moving it or setting it to a different value, uh, do you need to use floating point numbers? Uh, you can use anything. But it will stay a floating number. And this will be a floating point. You know, I mean, like for example, if you say move point, yeah, um, and uh, your point at the moment is a floating number, and then your the x, y is an uh, integer. Uh, if it depends, it depends on how it's defined for the beginning and how you, if you add a floating point to an integer, it will convert to a floating point. Yeah. But that's a discovered valid point that you, Python, you could do that and go from the integer to a floating point. And I, there is no checks in here for that. So let's design our, our class for a point. So as I said, class is a blueprint. So there is a keyword in, in Python called class. Then we define the name of our blueprint. So in this case, I usually define classes with an uppercase P to kind of distinguish them from no other uh, variables. Then there is a special method here. You can see here, Colon, so it requires an indentation. So now we define the methods of the function of the class. And there are special names that are predefined to do certain things. So for example, the function init here, 
that is a responsible to initialize the object when you create a new object. So for example, if we want, if we want to create a new point, but we want to make sure that X and Y is zero. That could or something else, but it has uh, its own attributes here are set to zero, and now you can see this this magic word self here. As the class is a blueprint, we can't refer to the actual object itself. So to be able to assign attributes to something that doesn't exist yet, we need to have something to do that, and the self here is the is that thing. So that can be replaced by the actual object itself when you when you create a new point. So if we do self dot point, self is replaced with the actual object. So every object you create will have its own x and y variables. And that's why we put self here. And you never have to actually, when you create a new object, you never have to deal with it. This is handle of mapping, which we'll see just later. And those self dot x and self are instance attributes, as they are called. They are attributes related to the, the point class. So if you want to create a new point, you just do like this, p equals to, and then the name of the class. And um, if you had any additional uh, arguments to the class here, you specify them when you create it, but you never specify cells. That is always left out. So here you have an empty point here. That will create a new p point object, q point object. And every time we do this, the init method will be called on both of these points. So P will get X and Y attributes, Q will get X and Y attributes when you call this because it will call the underscore underscore init function. And we can check here that this actually works by, uh, first we have to create them. And then we, I need to define the class first like this. Then we do like that. And then we can, print out the attributes. You can see here, yeah, there are an attribute here, x, y, 0. Uh, and you can also check here if it's, there is no other attribute. So if you do p.c here in this case, it doesn't have. So you can see that it actually created those two attributes when we created the object as well. You can also do something like this. You can do p dot x equals one, p dot y equals two. So you can change the attributes of the object just by signing to them like this. But one of the key concepts in, in object orientation is something called encapsulation. That the user of the object shouldn't be manipulating the internal state of the object. It should be hidden from the user. And uh, Python doesn't prohibit the access to insert attributes. Uh, but I, wish, I will go through how you can do encapsulation, but also how Python solves that in a really elegant way later on. But first we implement this with, we will make sure that you can't do this first. So we have, if you want to assign an, an internal attribute, you need to go through a method. That's it. encapsulation always, you call a function that uh, tells the object to do this, but you never change the attribute yourself. So the first thing we have to do is protect our internal attributes from, from the user. And there is actually, a, if you add two underscores to an attribute, uh, it's not possible to access that from an outside object. You can't do uh, p.x anymore. So this is hidden. You can't even access p dot underscore underscore y. It's completely hidden from the user. We add two variables to our class here so that we can, uh, when we create the object, we can pass over the actual position as well and assign our internal attributes. So now we can create an, a point like this. One, zero, works perfectly. But what happens when we do this? Oh, it doesn't like it at all. Because point object hasn't no has no attribute x. Now it's protected. I, we we can't even do. If we try to kind of bypass it here and add this one here. We can't even access that. So now we need to make some some way that we can access our internal attributes without directly. Uh, 
Air Force and so on. Um, and that was a show before. Uh, so we add methods to the, to the class. So we need one method for assigning the X. So we do def X. And all the methods function on an object needs to start with self. Uh, you don't need to call it, but it has to have it in, in its class declaration. So self, and then we have value here. And then we assign the internal attribute here. This is fine. And we do the same thing to Y. And we have a set method here, X comma Y, to set the values as well. They will set them up to do it uh, at the same time. Yeah, but I will, uh, this is the, this is, for example, if the attributes here would be a database somewhere else, uh, you don't want, or no, you don't, don't want the user object to know the details of how to access the database. So what, when you hide it like this, it could be a simple attribute like this, but it could be a more complex way of accessing. So encapsulation here hides the details. So now it seems really complicated to do this, but I will show you later on that you can start off really simple and add this functionality later without changing the, the user, the, the, the ones that are relying on your classes uh, to do any changes. So let's see, now I can do this. I can do point, I can set it, I can do assign X and Y. And we also have to do, now we can't get the values out of the object. So now we also have to define functions here for returning the value. So self X return the internal attributes. So we do functions for access and internal attributes. So all the inter internal workings of the object is hidden off. And now I can also do print.p.y, but I need to call them as functions here. And you can see if you are you see Java codes, there is a lot of set get methods for everything. And that is the object oriented way to do it. You hide the internal implementation. But Python has a really cool feature called properties, which makes it much less required to do all that stuff. You can do it afterwards. So let's say here, uh, uh, we have our get set methods, get y, and yeah, we have a lot to do here. You can define property here, x equals the property, get x. So uh, that is the function for retrieving the value. This is the function for setting the value. Same thing, y have a property, get y, set y. When you, let me just define this one here. Now we can use the object just like we did before. We can create the point, we can do p.x, and I assign a value, p.y, but we, this is not an attribute now, this is a property. So when you do this assignment, it will actually call set x, and this will set call set y. And we want to read it out, we can do p.x, it will call get y. And you can see I have added a lot of print statements here just to kind of illustrate what happens here. So if I run this here, you can see here set x, set y, those two, get x for this one, get y here. And now the nice thing with this is that you can start off doing the object notation. You can skip the set get until it's really needed. So you can just add a normal attribute dot x. And if you need to protect it somehow later, you can add a property without the code being changed. After. So this can be added afterwards, the, the, the property stuff. So one, one usage of this is, for example, if you have a attribute on an object that can't be larger than 100 or less than zero, if you set the x to 101, you can have an if statement inside that sets the x value to 100. So you clamp it. And that is used, you can, you can do, do, do this just with an assignment here. And it's, for the user of the object, it's just the same. And because you can add it afterwards, you don't have to be so strict when you design your object. You can just add an attribute, make it a proper property later and protect it. So that's make, so I usually when I do start off coding, I, I just do very simple objects with attributes. 
use them for the beginning and then I okay I need to make sure that this can't be a diff for example you can go from a string to a floating point and then you have an if statement inside to make sure that to protect the data but that I can add later so you can do really simple without the get set first and then there is even easier way of doing this so uh, instead of having uh, to write the property declarations later you can actually use something called decorators. Decorators is meta programming in Python. So uh, it's not part of the code itself. When the parser comes here, it will generate code to create a property. So if I have a X here, which is a function to return the internal attribute X, if I do property here, it will automatically create a property for this function as well. So you don't have to do this explicit declaration of properties. If I want a, a way of setting the value, you do x setter. And this is the only thing you have to do. One function for returning the attribute, one for setting it. And then the property will be created automatically. You can see here that it will call the different ones here automatically. It generated this code, these declarations here, uh, which we have here, those two here, will automatically generate it when you do use these decorator functions. And the convention is that you have, this will be the property name. And if you want a uh, setter, you have self and then the value you want to set it to as a second parameter here and that is the x property setter so you start with declaring the property which is a read only the read value and then you have the setter here with the dot setter okay um Yeah, now we have our properties, the attributes, and then we need to add methods to do things with objects. For example, we had before the, in the point function library, we had a way of moving the point. Then we can add a move, fell from dx to y, and then we just update the internal attributes here. And then you can see here that we can run this, and you can see here that it updates the i by five here. I will try to remove those. I don't think we need those. Yeah. Another nice function to have is a way of uh, copying the value attributes from another object to our, our own object. So in this area, we can do copy from self.p. So this is another object of the same type. Then we do the self.x equals to p.x. So then we can move it, print it, and then we copy, we create P1, we copy from P0. And at the end, they should be the same. You can see now it's the same here as well. Sorry? What do you mean it's the same? Yeah, so I, I I created two points, assigned them two different values. Yeah, yeah. And I, I now it's the same. Uh, then there are some special instance, me instance methods that you can use. We already covered in it here. This is called when you create an object. Uh, but there is another one that is called when you print an object. So one that's one of the disadvantages if you're, when you're creating your own object. Basically, you're creating new data types. And Python doesn't know anything about these data types. So if you try to print your own data type, it says like main point object. Uh, it's not very useful. So if you want to, to uh, let a point be able to print itself, we need to use the str function here. str is, uh, is called whenever uh, a, 
a Python needs a string of your object, it will call your str function. And it will do that when you print it or convert it to a string. If you do that, there is an str method in Python that will convert any object to a string. It will call the string method of your object. So we can add that to our uh, point class. So here at the end, we have underscore underscore str self. And it has to return a string that represents its own, its own object here. So in this case, we do point parenthesis. We convert the internal attribute x to a string. We add a comma, convert y to a string, and then add a parenthesis. So we define this here. And then when we run this now, oh, it can present itself nicely to us. So there is a lot of uh, these special functions. You can look them up in the Python documentation that does different things. For example, you can replace the operators. So plus, minus, multiplication, stuff like that. And define your own classes that can do its own algebra between themselves. And that you can do with these special functions. Usually, they, 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 yeah, they always start with double underscore. So this is the double underscore, double and the, the method here. Yes, and, and then classes as data types. So when you have created a class, basically you have, you have added a class to Python and it works just like any other object in Python. You can store it in dictionaries, you can store them in lists. So in this case here, I can do, I create an empty list here with points. I loop, say I want to create 10 points and I append points to, the, to my uh, points list here. There's also a quicker way of doing this in uh, in a one line here. So this is called an in, uh, implicit loop. So you have points, random points, four i in range ten. This will result of this in a single line. And then you can loop over these points here to print them out. And now because we have a print function, they all print nicely out their values. And also, just like with normal, you can check the IDs of your points here to see that they actually are just like any other Python points here. They are stored in different locations in memory. And you can also, if you do this, uh, P2 points to P0, P3 points to P1, you can see that they are the same rules apply for your own objects like they do for normal Python objects. There's no copying here. So P2 is now pointing to P0, P3 points to P1. So P2 and P3, they're the same as those two here. So another key feature of object orientation is the ability to reuse code. So now we have a point. The point knows how to move itself. It knows how to uh, set itself in space. Uh, and say we have a circle. It also needs to have, be able to place itself in space. Uh, you need to. You also want, would like to move it, but it has an additional attribute of a radius. So what we can do now, we can inherit all the properties from for, from our previous class point. So we create a new class circle, but it says, okay, but I want to it be this, uh, have have the same basic function as the point, but we will add more to it. So we have to create a new init function here that takes x, y, and r as input. So we add a radius here now. The first thing we have to do when we have a, when we inherit a new class or make a new class that derives from a different class is that we need to call uh, points initializer first. That's the first thing we do in the init section. So super here, instead of writing point here, we can do super here that will return you the point, the derived class name instead of we have to specify it directly. Init and then x y. So we call the constructor or the initialization function from the point here. Otherwise, x and y will not exist as attributes in the point. Then we add our own self, r equals r. We add properties, we add a copy from, and we also need to add a print because if we don't add a print, it will print point. So if we want to make sure that the circle actually prints itself as a circle, we need to add str from this. But we don't have to do anything with the move or set functions. Also, the properties for x and y, we get them for free here. 
So we create a new uh, blueprint for our circle that just adds the R and a new print function. Of course, we need to also make sure that we in the copy that we copy the radius property over as well. So now we can see here, we can create a point, we can create a circle. The circle has a radius property now, R, but we can use move on base, both of them. So those circle inherited move, and we can use the print here. So when we print the point, it will print uh, the SDR method from the P here and the circle from the circle print from when you print the circle, but move is the same. So inheritance is one way of creating more complex structures. Uh, one, one pattern that is more common is the composite clauses pattern. And that means that you, you create new clauses consisting of existing clauses. So for example, the line uh, owns two points. So it consists of two points, but we don't inherit from point. That's useless. A line depends on the points to be able to draw between those points. So we, we when we init here, we initialize two point instances here. So P0 and P1 will contain the positions of the starting point and end point of the line. Then we have property P0 table to uh, return the point. And we have a new print section here. So now you can see here, I can create a new line uh, here. And you have the property P0. And here you can assign X and Y coordinates to position uh, point 0 and point 1. But what happens if we do like this? Does this work? We just try it and see what happens. So it can't set attribute P0. And the reason for that is if we go back here, we only have a property. We don't have a set. So P0 is actually a read only. It can, you can only return the actual P0. You can't replace that point. And this is a design choice that you can make uh, to be able to do that. So if you comment this one out here, run it again. You can see here it works 0.0 to 0 0.3.0. But you could uh, allow the user to actually replace the points with their own points. So that is, a, if you have a CAD drawing program, you can change the line from one point to another point. That is also fine. Then you just add the P0 setter and P1 setter here so that you can assign new points to the line class. So in this way, you can do just like we did before, but you can also create P3 and P4 and assign P0, P3, P1, P4, and it will also work. So now you can see that the points go from 5, 5 to 10, 10, which is the P3 and P4. But that is a design choice. So it's not, you can have assignable instance objects, but you can also have them be read only. That's a nice thing with properties to do, which you can't do with normal attributes. You can make them read only. So you can say that you, you can't assign this property. And that is something that you build into your program uh, as a kind of rules. So now we can also add a method for calculating the length of the line. So we have a property length, which actually does some calculations here. And that is also something hard to do with an attribute. Attribute is just a variable to a storage location. Here we can have a property that does calculation. So you can see here, this is not, uh, you could have done this as a function that you call, which calculates the length, but you can also use it as a property here. Uh, and when that property is called, the length is calculated automatically. Okay, it's Sorry? It is uh, that's his uh, race two. So that's his uh, C remnants of each. So it's a power two. So this is the base and this is the exponent. You could have done double double as well with L2 multiplications. So final thing, uh, polymorphism. Uh, 
So in Python, in, in object orientation, when you have a classes that are derived from the same base type, uh, Python, if you call a method and uh, the method is not found in the the class that it's, it goes up the class hierarchy to find the, the method to call. For example, when we did the uh, uh, printing of the object without the str function, Python queried if there is there any str function up the chain, and all objects in Python inherit from the object class. An object has a base str function to print any object, so it goes up and prints the object with yeah, not so good results. But anyway, uh, but what we can do here is that. An example we see is I have a shapes list here. I append point, circle, line, uh, floating point, an integer, and a string. And I loop over them and I print them. And regardless of the type here, it will go in and print, find a print that belongs to a certain uh, object. So, in, for example, if circle didn't have a print, it, or str function will go to the points str function. So it will find a suitable function for any of these objects here. And this actually works here. So if you run this, it knows which method to call for each of these objects. So for point, it knows it's called the str function of the point. For the circle, it's called, um, it's called the circle version. The line has its own. And actually, the floating point number also has the str method because that's also an object that has an str, so it can be printed. So one can consider what actually forty two the print forty two actually really mean, and this is actually what is going to call. So forty two dot zero as an object dot str. So the floating point number actually has the ability to convert itself to a string. So that, that's the kind of, um, the same thing here. If you point a circle, you can loop over and move them both because they know uh, it will not find a move function in circle. So it continues up the line. Oh, there is a move function in points. So I would call that. That is what polymorphism means. It will go up the chain and find if there is a suitable function to call starting from the instance here, circle, going to point, and if the point is, does not have a move, it will continue up until it says, OK, there is no one. So if I would try, for example, moves, it will be really, you can see here, point object has no attribute moves. So it needs to exist. So you basically overwrite functions that you find them in a new way in the class. Yeah. And so, it, so if you override move in, in circle, it will call move in the circle first. So it, you, you can uh, you usually override it when you want to specialize something. Um, if, you, if you can rely on the point, you just don't re-implement it in circle. You said the floating number basically calls itself to be a string when printing it. Yeah. Um, when you print like Strings and floating points and this kind of um, at least from my experience, in you have to always convert the integers, floating you know, numbers into a string before you can like put them together. Do you also have to do that in Python? Or just um, this so the print statement here to be able to print, it needs to convert this, and this it will do that automatically. It's called S through R here. But some, in some situation, if we want to, for example, combine a floating point number with a string, uh, you, it doesn't do it automatically. So then you have to do STR and then so you can add them together. But for just printing, it knows how to convert itself to a string. So that was a short start in object orientation. Uh, just to give you an overview. Then I will, on, on Thursday, I will do a more graphical way of why is it really needed and why can you, how can you use this efficiently when you have a lot of objects. So, uh, for example, you can do a particle system. 
with points. And the particle knows how to move themselves. Like you can set the speed and you can move them around in a very simple syntax. So, um, and also if you look at many of the, we will come to how do you do user interfaces in, in uh, Python, you use Qt. And Qt is a class library with um, thousands of classes for defining user interfaces, buttons, checkboxes. It lends it very well to an object-oriented design. So, um, but then you have to be a bit careful also with object orientation because it's also is tempting to do a lot of object in numerical codes. But you, there is a point where you need to allocate memory in chunks to be efficient. And having a lot of small objects that are separate in different objects is not very efficient for memory. So at some point you need to stop the, the object or the design and say, okay, I will, I will operate on groups of points. So I, I could have a particle system that has a list of points in an array. So I object on, but I don't go down to every each particle has its own memory. So that, that is the design decision you have to take. All right, but okay, that was it for today. Any questions? Otherwise, I stop recording now.